Bruce U. Utah Phillips has spent a lifetime rattling cages. He sees no reason to stop now. My first writing, and it continues to be pretty much that way today, is, is made out of what I see going on in the world around me. Internalized, of course, funneled through my own uh, perceptions and my own prejudices, yes, my own bias. But nonetheless, um, I adopted the principle that nothing happens inside of you unless something happens outside first. Bruce Duncan Phillips was born in Cleveland, Ohio in 1935. He was named after the legendary Robert the Bruce and King Duncan of Scotland. He comes from a long line of rabble-rousers and individualists. His mother worked for the Congress of Industrial Organizations. His father was a member of the Communist Party. Phillips himself has been a member of the Industrial Workers of the World, the Wobblies, for more than 40 years. The Union songs have been a big part of his repertoire. Solidarity Forever, composed by Ralph Chaplin in 1915, has long been considered the anthem of the American labor movement. Joe Hill celebrates the life of the great wobbly songwriter. I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night, live as you and me. With his trademark flannel shirt, suspenders, and a big floppy hat, Utah Phillips epitomizes the quintessential American outsider. A bit on the ornery side, if provoked, perhaps, but generally kind and amiable, with a strong appreciation of the underdog. He belongs to an America that some say no longer exists, an America where a person's word meant something, when caring came with no strings attached, and when people admired real people, not what he calls Saturday morning cartoon people. Ask a kid, who are your heroes? Chances are they'll give you the names of made-up people. Huh? What happened to the time when heroes were flesh-and-blood people? You know, people like Emma Goldman or Elizabeth Gurley Flynn or Mother Jones or Big Bill Haywood or Babe Ruth, Joe DiMaggio, great boxers, you know, Joe Lewis. Grandparents, what's wrong with your grandparents being heroes, see? My mother, she worked for the CIO as a labor organizer, and she made sure that we had appropriate heroes, flesh and blood people. Phillips has been collecting stories most of his life. He started as a teenager, listening and remembering the tales told to him by the hobos, tramps, and bums, the burnt out alcoholics, and washed up country singers he met while riding the rails. Even as a young boy, the rattle of a passing train had its hold on him. At first he picked up the ukulele, but soon turned to the guitar and began writing songs in the style of Jimmy Rogers, Hank Snow, and Gene Autry. You know that I was a Korean War veteran. Said, yeah. The Korean War had a profound effect on Phillips. He emerged a bitter and enraged man, disillusioned and disgusted by the flagrant racism and violence he observed all around him. For two years he drifted, barely living, drinking too much and tramping back and forth across the country. An encounter with Catholic Workers Movement activist Eamon Hennessy at the Joe Hill House in Salt Lake City changed his life around completely. Hennessy, a one-man social revolution, persuaded Phillips to become a pacifist, to counter his violent tendencies with compassion and humanity. He taught me what it means to be an anarchist. As he put it, somebody who doesn't need a cop to tell him what to do. He quoted Mark Twain to me, loyalty to the country always, loyalty to the government when it deserves it. Phillips spent the 1960s performing at anti-war rallies, working on behalf of migrant laborers and participating in numerous strikes. He made a living as a worker in a warehouse and then as an archivist for the state of Utah. In 1968, he even became a candidate for the U.S. Senate on the Peace and Freedom Party ticket, collecting some 6,000 votes. Not enough to win an election, perhaps, but at least indication that someone out there was listening. Throughout the odd jobs and periods of unemployment, Phillips continued to write songs. With the encouragement of folk singer Rosalie Sorrells and other friends, he left Utah behind late one rainy night in 1969 with $75 and a Volkswagen van. 
At places like Cafe Lena in Saratoga Springs, New York, he hoped to make a few bucks and ward off hunger by telling stories and sharing songs. Intending to return home soon, he instead found a new life with the Rodas' home and the folk community as his extended family. And through luck and happenstance, he also found a new career. It never occurred to me anybody made a living at this. Are you cold, forlorn, and hungry? Are Phillips dares to sing about life? subjects that others Is either sweep under the rug or, worse, refuse to acknowledge whatsoever, like that great American taboo, class. One obstacle we have today is getting the working class to acknowledge that they are the working class. Class is not income level, Phillips insists. Class defines your relationship to the means of production. If you've got a boss, you are a member of the working class. And dump the bosses off your back. As for himself, Phillips says that he owns the means of production. I have no bosses, only partners and I play for people I like. What I do is I collect stories. Phillips is hardly some stuffy folk singer stuck in the past. After making numerous recordings on small folk labels like Rounder and Philo, in 1996, the veteran musician teamed up with 20-something singer-songwriter Ani DeFranco. Based on two decades' worth of Phillips' live performances, DeFranco fashioned a timeless piece of pure Americana, producing The Past Didn't Go Anywhere, bringing together different generations and musical styles, and creating what could conceivably be called folk rap. Before Heart Trouble forced him to retire from live performances in late 1995, Phillips played more than 100 gigs a year. He now makes his home in Nevada City, California, and is currently completing work on a book of songs and stories of the 30 or so years he has spent on the road. When learning he was to receive the Life Achievement Award, Phillips offered the following comment. Why it fell to me, I can't truly say I know, and this is no false modesty. I'm only a cog in something much larger, something more pervasive and something vastly more important than any one of us. It is a movement toward a human culture not a mass marketing culture, toward a human village culture in which we authentically share with each other the substance of our lives. Clearly, this world has not heard the last of this wayfaring storyteller, this subversive teller of tales, not by a long shot. Invariably, Phillips closes his shows with a sing-along version of Hallelujah, I'm a Bum, which he calls the new national anthem. Hallelujah, I'm a bum. Hallelujah, bum again. Hallelujah, give us a hand out to revive us again. What is the moral of all of this? What exactly is Bruce Utah Phillips trying to say? If one had to describe the world according to Bruce, the following thoughts would come to mind. Take good care of yourself and one another, for no one else will. Take charge of your own life. If you want to change the world, change yourself. Don't take no for an answer. And most significant of them all, raise a big ruckus and don't forget to rattle some cages. Perhaps it's best, though, that Utah himself have the last word. The best and healthiest thing that's happening in America today is organized folk music and organized folk dancing. All right? And that's happening at the bottom. And that's the part that I honor. That's the part that I cleave to. And those are the people that help me to make a living year after year for near, going, on 20, going on 30 years, year after year, without a boss. Try to beat that. 